my name is uh, Claudio Popa, and uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about PyLint and uh, about static analysis and code quality in general. Um, I started contributing to PyLint a couple of years ago, and uh, since last year I'm um, uh, its maintainer. And uh, during this uh, period, I started to uh, learn a lot about uh, this kind of things, uh, and I want to share with you uh, this knowledge that uh, that I gathered in these years. So, um, if you don't know, PyLint is a, a linter, um, which basically is a software that you run on, on your code in order to find various flows in your, in your program. Um, and it's based on the entire area of research called static analysis, which basically means that no line from your code will ever be executed, only uh, interpreted in a, in a form. Uh, and it's one of the oldest static analysis tool um, currently available in the Python world and open source, um, being created 12 years ago by a French company. Um, yep, and PyLint is uh, quite a lot more than just a simple linter. Um, it's also uh, a style checker. It um, enforces PEP8 um, as, uh, as its co coding standard. And um, it's also a type checker uh, and such. It, it, it looks for uh, violations of type system in, in your program such as adding strings to integers or um, trying to raise objects which um, aren't exceptions or trying to uh, um, unpack too many variables uh, in, um, uh, in too many objects in too few variables and stuff like that. Um, also, it's a structural analyzer, which basically means uh, that it looks for design patterns in your code and uh, at your at, at your class's uh, implementation in order to look for, for its uh, integrity. Uh, and it's quite comprehensive in the sense that it has uh, over 200 checks um, of various errors. And that's quite a lot. Um, there are many reasons to, to use a static analysis tool like PyLint. Um, for instance, if you want, if you want to enforce a um, consistent coding, uh, coding standard across your projects or with your team, um, also, if you want to um, improve the general code quality of, uh, of your project or projects, or if you have a lot of uh, systems uh, that don't have tests or very few tests at all, uh, it's a lot better to use a static analysis with these tests than not using anything at all. Uh, also, you can use it as a form of uh, review before committing or on your pull request or anything like that. Um, and if you don't use a static analysis tool right now, you should definitely try one, not just piling any, any other tool. Because um, as you can see, we, we are living in, in an age where uh, the software gets more and more complex, um, uh, which means that um, uh, in order to, uh, to release our software faster and uh, uh, to get ahead of the competition, uh, we need to release it faster, uh, which means that we need to have faster iteration cycles, um, and this, uh, these things come, come with a trade-off uh, in the sense that uh, a faster iteration cycles means that uh, we're not having a very good design, or having a very good design is not a priority anymore in some of our projects. Um, and uh, shipping our software faster is a virtue rather than uh, thinking about uh, what we need to implement correctly there. Uh, and in order to do that, we're uh, relying to um, tricks like cutting corners, st uh, starting to use features uh, that don't necessarily make our implementation clean, but uh, they just provide us more time to, to release more features and so on. And this means that we have less time to do proper reviews and uh, to write comprehensive tests. Um, and about comprehensive tests, just start to use, for instance, hypothesis on, on your uh, project and to see how many bugs uh, you have without being aware of them. Um, that's because we're living to what I like to call the looks good to me age, where our reviews are less and less um, um, or more and more superficial and um, they, um, they tend to, um, to uh, be uh, gathered around uh, style checking or uh, other um, properties like that, which are better off to be handled by tools rather than humans. Um, yeah, and 
right now it's less important to challenge a feature, to reject a feature, um, and it's more important to accept it because, hey, you got the contribution in your project. Um, yep. Um, and where I'm going with this is uh, to say that um, almost all the software is broken in one form or, or another. Um, for instance, uh, with Pylint, I'm doing uh, from time to time uh, analysis, analysis on, uh, on PyP projects in order to see where should I change or where should I add new features. And um, I see a lot of code that's broken uh, in production, released on, on PyP that uh, has no tests or no good coverage uh, at all. And um, the correct stance or the better stance uh, is to start using static uh, analysis in your projects rather than uh, not using anything. Um, for instance, uh, I'd like to show this example uh, that I actually found on, on, a, uh, on a project on, on PyP, uh, where basically the author of the code uh, wrote a, t a tree class which had a delete method uh, except the, the fact that uh, the delete method didn't have uh, a self parameter defined. So basically that node from the method is self. And uh, when it tried to run, to, to run that code, uh, it crashed because delete doesn't accept an extra parameter. And uh, this was released, uh, uh, this was fixed by, by the author. Yep. Uh, any code? No, uh, I, I'm uh, meaning uh, Python package index. Yeah, and it's rendered as function. Yeah. Um, and what I was saying was that the author of the code uh, actually released a, a version that fixed this co this uh, this problem later on. Uh, but what's m more worrying is the fact that this code was released without actually being tested that it works. Um, another example is uh, the one with, uh, with the context manager where uh, there's a class uh, that's supposed to be a context manager, but uh, the author of the code forgot to, put the, to define the extra parameters of the exit method. Um, and what happened was it crashed uh, when executed that runtime. Um, here's another example which is uh, uh, not a bug per se, but um, it's still a problem I in a way. Uh, basically, um, th this class uh, is expected to be a context manager, but doesn't define these, these capabilities uh, in, in itself. Uh, instead, it relies on subclasses to, uh, to implement those, uh, those capabilities themselves. But this brings a burden, uh, a cognitive burden, when trying to review this kind of code, because now you have to check for for other classes to see if they provide this or not. Um, yeah, and what would have been better uh, was to, to define these uh, capabilities as abstract met methods in the implementation of the base class. And it would have been nicer just by reading the structure of the class, you would have known that uh, uh, this class is expected to be a context manager. Yeah. Now, um, Piling can detect quite a lot of other errors. Um, for instance, in this example, um, I have a module which I don't use, um, import OS, that OS module. Uh, I also have a variable executed, which I never use in my, in my code. Um, at line eight, uh, I have a, a for statement, a for, a for block, uh, but it's put right under a raise statement, which means it will never reach yeah, and to make uh, things worse, at line 10, uh, I forgot to put the parentheses at the, for the execute method. And uh, what's happening is that method does nothing at all. So Pilot uh, warns me about this and says, hey, uh, at line 8, you have unreachable code. And that code is dead code, or you need to take a look. Uh, and at line 10, that statement doesn't seem to have any effect at all. So I'm not sure what you're doing there, but some, something is fishy. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it can detect uh, even more uh, um, critical bugs that can actually crush your code. Uh, like in this example where um, uh, I'm using a variable which is not defined, out file, um, and I'm trying to call an instance which um, can't be called, an instance of a zip file. And uh, the same uh, thing hap happens, is that Pilot 
tells me about uh, all all these errors that uh, are in my code, and I can go there and start fixing them. Um, okay. Uh, here, here's another one which is uh, quite interesting because this is not a bug per se, or not a, uh, not something that crashes your program in the real sense. But um, let's say I have a function which uh, verifies a condition that is true or false, and I'm trying to um, verify this condition in an if statement. But uh, I forgot to put the parentheses uh, for the function call, um, and what's happening is that the if branch will always be taken because the uh, function, uh, functions are always true in Python. So yeah, this, this code is practically incorrect from, from the author perspective. And uh, it can be caught by having good tests, but most of the projects don't have good tests at all. Yeah. <coughs> um, now, um, how Pilot actually does this, uh, this stuff, how, how it detects all these kind of issues. Um, its workflow is uh, quite simple. I mean, it's not so complicated. Um, you pass it a file or multiple files or a project or multiple projects, uh, whatever. And what it does, it tries to get uh, the, the AST for, the, for each file. Uh, basically, the AST is, the, is a tree structure that represents uh, your code. Um, and then uh, it, it will try to uh, wrap that AST with our own AST, which is uh, a lot better than the one uh, provided by the Python standard library. Uh, and then we are passing these, these new objects to um, the Python pylins checkers, uh, which um, they don't do nothing else than looking for patterns of code, uh, of bad code in, in these ASTs, um, which is not that, that difficult after all. Um, and at this point, we can add a lot more phases, but uh, they are relevant now. Um, yeah, actually, um, Pylint uh, is composed uh, by two by two other projects. Uh, we have Pylint itself, which is the component with patterns, um, and also we have Asteroid, which is, is the uh, project that provides us with uh, with a custom AST, and it's also our inference engine. Um, and we're, we're using the AST module internally, but um, we're trying to move away from that because um, it's not backwards compatible. Uh, the API changes uh, uh, from minor release to uh, another minor release from 3.2 to 3.3 <coughs> by adding new nodes or by renaming nodes whatsoever. Um, and the idea is that uh, we are trying to have a compatibility layer that works both on Python 2.7 up to Python 3.5 and works as well on PyPy or Jython or whatever. Um, and for that reason, we, we have a similar API with the um, built-in AST module um, because we, wa we want to, for it to be basically a drop-in replacement of it. And as you can see, you, you just give it a string and uh, from that string, it returns an, an AST, which you can manipulate in any way you'd want. Um, as you can see in this example, for instance, have an AST for, for a lambda functions, which receives uh, a parameter called uh, x, um, and returns that uh, parameter added with, uh, with one. Yeah. Now, I mentioned um, earlier that um, Asteroid trees are a little bit more capable because they provide some capabilities that are not just useful for static analysis, but for other purposes uh, as well. Um, and for instance, you can, you can retrieve the parent of a node, if you have a node, um, as it is in this example where the parent of the assigned statement will be the, the function uh, where it is defined. Um, also, you can retrieve the children, uh, the children of a node. Yep. And you can implement uh, uh, traversal functions if you want, just with these two things. Um, there, there's also uh, there, there are some capabilities for obtaining the scope of um, of a node in uh, in Python. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the scope of the um, assigned statement in the first uh, example is going to be the module. 
that's like an empty, uh, that's like a script with just that assignment and the scope is the module. Um, while in the second example, the, the scope of the assignment is going to be the function where, where it is defined, because functions uh, create creates new scope scopes in Python. And uh, lastly, um, the scope of the full variable uh, in the list comprehension uh, is going to be the list comprehension itself. This is on Python uh, 3, uh, because on Python 2, uh, that, that variable leaks outside, and the scope is the scope, the parent of uh, the scope parent of the list comprehension. Yeah, but they fix this in Python 3, which is a lot nicer now. And also, so, uh, some uh, nodes are augmented with um, uh, capabilities tailored especially for them. Um, for instance, uh, in this example, I have a class which um, uses a meta class, uh, abc.abcmeta. Sorry. And also, it uses a non-trivial method resolution order, uh, uh, order dict and some other classes, and uses some slots, defines some slots. Um, and let's say by using the slots method of, uh, of a class node, you can retrieve what slots were defined uh, in that class. Um, by using the meta class method, you can retrieve the meta class, etc. Uh, and uh, if you call, for instance, the MRO method, you can retrieve the method resolution order. Um, and what's interesting is that that method resolution order is actually the same as uh, the method resolution order that Python would have give uh, if uh, this code uh, was uh, were to be executed. And this is really uh, awesome for for a, a tool that um, doesn't run your co code to understand. Um, yeah, but the most important thing that Asterisk provides um, is basically the the, infer the inference rules, um, which uh, uh, have so something in, in common with type inference. But uh, in Python and Asterisk, we're more interested in uh, what objects are involved in an expression rather than what the types of uh, these objects are. Uh, and for that, we're trying to um, to infer as, ma as much as possible, not just types. Um, and basically, each node um, has uh, its own inference rules. For instance, uh, an inference rule for, for a name node would mean uh, that you'd want to find out what that name really represents. I mean, um, if you solve that name, what's the value of it? And uh, for instance, what will happen is that uh, um, we will do uh, a lookup for that name uh, according to Python semantics uh, in the sense that uh, uh, first we will look in the local scope and then in the enclosing scope and global and built in and if not, then we will raise a statement. Uh, uh, we will raise an exception. Um, okay, let's see an example where I have this simple function which accepts uh, two parameters, A and B, and adds them together. And uh, right below is the AST of the of the function, uh, which is not that complicated, but basically you have uh, an arguments node, which contains the names that are in those arguments. Uh, you also have a return statement and um, a binary uh, operation node, which um, contains a name, the operation itself, and uh, the other part of the binary operation. Um, and let's, uh, let's uh, say that we are calling this function with uh, two values. First is A. Um, which is two, and uh, second, uh, the last element of uh, of uh, that list, which is going to be three, uh, and that's the AST for uh, for this uh, this piece of code. Um, and what will happen? First, um, um, the A uh, name will is going to be inferred, um, and that name is going to be two because it's quite simple in this case. But uh, for B, that, that's going to be a little bit more complicated because first uh, we have to see what B is, uh, really is. And B is uh, a subscript node which uh, um, has a list and uh, uh, there's an index on that list. And um, according to, uh, to the inference rules, uh, we're going to infer um, what the uh, subscript does and uh, it's going to retrieve the, the uh, three value from the list. And uh, then it's going to be passed later on. Okay. R 
right. And after solving what uh, A and B really pre represents, that's uh, two and three, um, we're going to, uh, to try to determine um, what's the relation between them. Uh, for instance, if uh, the left-hand side uh, is a, a subtype or a, sup a super type of the right-hand side, or if they have the same type, because the rules uh, are different um, for, for each case. And um, in this uh, simple example, they bo both have the same type, and uh, that's going to be inferred to five. And that result is going to be returned up to the inference uh, um, entry point. Um, let's see something a little bit more complicated, uh, as it is this example, where I'm defining a class called A, um, which also defines uh, um, a method uh, called uh, a dunder add method. And also, I have a, cl a class B, which will be a subtype of A, uh, that defines a dunder air add, add method. And I'm trying to add an instance of B to an instance of A. And according to the rules, uh, A is a super type of B. So first, uh, um, B uh, dunder uh, air add will be called. And that returns not implemented, which basically says, hey, I don't know how, how to process this uh, fallback to, to the other method. And then um, B dot add will be, will be tried. And if you do the calcula uh, calculations, um, that's actually going to be going to be 45, which is really cool for a tool to do that statically. Yes. Um, another uh, example that shows how um, Asteroid understands the method resolution order of uh, of your classes uh, is this one, where I have a class. Uh, uh, e that uh, inherits from uh, both C and B, and the method resolution order for, for this class is going to be E, C, B, A, and object. Um, and this code has uh, three er uh, errors in it. First, there's no uh, spa attribute anywhere in the method resolution order, there's only spam. So at line 16, there's going to be an error. Also at line 15 is going to be an error uh, with foo, because foo is an integer, and foo will not be, we will, it will not be called. And uh, 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 more complex than this, uh, is going to, uh, a bug more complicated than this is going to be at line 14, uh, where I have a super C and, and self, uh, and uh, a call of boo with five and six. But if you don't know how a super works, basically it's like, the, like this. The second parameter says, uh, uh, provides method resolution order, and the second parameter is self, and the method resolution order of self, which is E, is going to be ECBA. And the first parameter says, from where in the method resolution order, you should start looking, um, which is from C, uh, and that means start looking from B and A. And this means that bboo will be called, but bboo doesn't define um, does, doesn't define two parameters, only one parameter. So that's going to crash. And since uh, Pilot uh, or Asteroid knows all of this, um, Pilot can know this as well and say says, hey, you, you have too many positional arguments uh, at line 14, or you have. Uh, uh, you're trying to call something which is not callable, or you're trying to access something that's just not defined out there. And, yeah. uh, and this one is a little bit more complicated and uh, involves uh, quite a lot of uh, things. Um, we have, for instance, um, um, position, uh, multiple positional arguments, uh, keyword arguments. Uh, we have context managers built with context lib. Um, List slicing, list indexing, uh, a bunch of built-ins. Um, yeah, we, we have uh, basically a uh, to with statement used and uh, trying to unpack um, uh, a tuple or, or a dictionary. And uh, yeah, just Astrid knows how, how to infer all, all of this stuff and just builds the result and shows, show, shows, shows the result to you. Yeah. Um, the inference uh, has a couple of properties. Um, they are not very useful in the general case, but if you know them, you, you might know what kind of capa capabilities you can expect from Asteroid to, to have. 
Um, and for instance, um, it is uh, partially flow insensitive. Basically, uh, an influence can be uh, categorized in, into, two, uh, into two categories. Uh, flow sensitive and flow insensitive. A flow sensitive uh, will mean that it, it's going to take into account the um, order of your statements in, in the program. Um, and uh, as such, it's going to take in, into account if statements for while loops, whatever. Uh, while a flow insensitive approach uh, doesn't do anything like that. Uh, and Asteroid is uh, partially flow insensitive because we do take into account a part of uh, uh, we, uh, the order of statements in the programs, and we can pre uh, perform, for instance, strong updates. Uh, a strong update is like in this example, I'm defining um, an integer called x, and later on I have another uh, uh, variable with the same name, which is a string. Uh, and asteroid infers that uh, the result of uh, that function call is going to be a string, not an integer or uh, union between them. But um, we are also partially flow insensitive because uh, currently we're ignoring um, um, if statements and uh, for for loops and while statements, uh, etc. Uh, as it is in this example where uh, Pilot doesn't understand that uh, uh, we're going to return a template instance, uh, but instead it thinks we're going to uh, return a, a string and both a template instance. Um, and also, it is path insensitive in the sense that we don't assume branch con conditions. Um, as it is in, in this example, uh, where I have an integer x, which is into if, into if branch greater than zero, and Astro does, doesn't uh, uh, assume this information right now, uh, or the opposite in the else statement, uh, but uh, that's going to be changed later on. Okay, and uh, finally, it's also context sensitive, um, which means that uh, we're considering the context of a, of a function call. Um, as it is in this example, basically, uh, there's going to be a context stack with all the arguments that, that are passed down. Uh, and yeah, finally, um, having good inference uh, really improves your linter because if you understand the code for which you build a static analysis tool, then you can, you can find a lot of uh, more interesting bugs uh, rather than just uh, uh, fooling around with types. Um, and right now, we, we do understand a, a big subset of Python, uh, for instance, super or um, a bunch of built-ins, uh, quite a lot of them, actually. Um, arithmetic operations, comparisons, context managers, uh, so on and so, so forth. Yeah. Uh, if there is an error with a class and um, Pilot finds a bug there, uh, we're going to check if that class has unknown base classes, uh, which means that, uh, as it is in this example, I'm importing from a module which doesn't exist, a class, and I'm trying to use that class as a context manager. But we can't assume that that class will provide um, the context manager methods or not. Uh, and in this, in this example, it's better to assume that it's going to provide those capabilities and to have a false negative rather than to have a false positive because false positives are actually uh, impeding your, your work with, with the linter or a static analysis tool. Um, and other checks we are, we are doing, for instance, if um, we are verifying if a class uh, is a mixing, if an operation is done in a mixing class or in an abstract class, because it's all right for mixing class to, classes to not have a method or not have some capabilities, um, as it is in this example where that method can be in some other class or defined in my class or so on, and we just assume that they are defined and we skip the error entirely. Or if we have uh, uh, inference errors, um, as it is in this example, we don't know what missing module is, we don't know what unknown is, so it's better to assume that it's, this code is going to work rather than assuming that it's not going to work. And this means that we're also verifying uh, very often the state of the inference. Yep. And even these checks uh, and verifications aren't actually useful when 
we have to deal with stuff like uh, uh, globals or locals, or we have to deal with extension modules, basically because extension modules can be analyzed statically. You have to import them and do a bunch of, uh, um, of uh, things with them to transform them to ASTs in order to work with them. Um, also, if the code you're supposed to understand is trying to be too smart, um, and this is actually true because whenever I found uh, a, a bug or an error with Pilot and uh, I tried to investigate what was happening, uh, that code that provoked an error was just too smart. Um, for instance, like this. Um, let's, uh, and some users are actually expecting static analysis tools to, to support th these kind of, uh, of examples. Um, the first one is from uh, the Nose uh, library, which is a test runner. And that piece of code involves a lot of uh, things like uh, uh, list comprehension, um, some methods verifying that uh, a string is, is part of another string, um, then patching globals um, uh, by putting stuff in vars. Uh, and this is uh, at the global uh, module scope, which means that vars is just globals, uh, or uh, patching um, uh, done their all and uh, up appending uh, some objects. And users are, are coming on, on the bug tracker and are saying, hey, why, why, the, uh, why Palint uh, doesn't work with, with nose? Yeah, it sucks. Um, and the other example is from, from multiprocessing where they're doing the, the same thing, patching globals and stuff. Yep. Um, <coughs> There's a lot of uh, things you can do with, uh, with Pilot. You can actually define your own plugins if you want to. Uh, there are quite a lot of them uh, for most known pro uh, projects like Django, Flask, or, or Celery. Um, you, you can also use a, a tool which, is, uh, which comes with Pilot called PyReverse to generate UML diagrams for a project. Um, also, we have a spell checker and a Python 3 porting checker. Um, and let's see the spell checker in action, uh, as it is in this example where I have a comment with uh, two words that are misspelled. And just by activating the, the spell checker with uh, an English dictionary, uh, it's going to say, hey, you misspelled this word. Did you mean this uh, variant of the word or that variant? Yeah, and this can be really useful. Um, yeah, and we also have a um, Python 3 porting checker, which uh, detects problems about uh, uh, compatibility between uh, Python 2 and Python 3. Um, and this component um, disables all the other checkers, so you won't have a, a tons of uh, messages uh, when running it, only those that are uh, responsible for, for this particular use case. And um, as you can see from this example, we have, let's say we have that, that function called download, which uh, receives a link and downloads it somewhere. And uh, later on, we're, we're calling that function with the map, uh, with the map built in. But that code will never run on Python 3 uh, because the map is um, lazy, lazy evaluated. So, so you need to either convert that to a list or transform that map call to, to, a, to a for statement. Um, and uh, the Python 3 porting checker just says, hey, you, uh, you're using this built-in when, when not iterating. And that's, sure, that's surely an error or something like that. Um, yeah. uh, there are a lot of other similar tools, um, each one with, uh, uh, it's, uh, with their own capabilities. Um, there, there is, for instance, PyFlex, which is um, Lightweight, uh, it's extremely fast, but detects only a handful of, uh, of errors. But it promises to not have false positives and so on and so forth. But it doesn't find any interesting bugs in your in your code. Um, there's also PyChecker, which is ac actually the forefather of Pilot. Uh, actually, uh, there isn't PyChecker anymore because uh, it's dead for a couple of years, and it wasn't really static because. Um, it imported uh, your modules, which is obviously wrong, uh, but uh, it detects a lot of issues that most of the static analyzers in, in Python currently don't detect. Uh, and uh, the new trend is uh, MyPy, which is an optional type checker for, for Python. Um, 
which basically has support for type hints through annotations, uh, PEP 484, and it's work in progress, and you might not find it as useful as it is right now. Yep. Um, and there are a lot of uh, things going on currently in, in uh, Pilint. Uh, we're trying to release Pilint um, 2.0 next year, uh, and we're trying to have some new uh, cutting edge features like um, understanding uh, flow, uh, flow control and having some interesting analysis like uh, data flow analysis or escape analysis. And we're also trying to have a better data model uh, than we currently have. For instance, we don't understand descriptors right now. Um, and we're going to try to add support for uh, PEP 484 for, for annotations uh, later on. Yeah, I am, I'm interested in bringing more contributors to the project. And yeah, uh, that's all. Thank you.